Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 75 of the Compassion and Cucumbers podcast. I'm Christine. And I'm Sam. 75. 75. What is that? It's not golden. What's golden? Is it golden? Golden is 100. Well, I mean, are you um, talking about wedding anniversaries? Yeah, anniversaries. Um, I know 50 is silver, right? No, 50 is golden. 50 is... Most people don't get to a 75th wedding anniversary. Oh, 25 is silver. 50 yes. is golden. Yes. 75 is... I don't know. I don't know. It Platinum, maybe? Yeah, platinum. But I don't think many people get to a 75th wedding anniversary. Probably not. No. I have a feeling that's pretty rare. Probably. You're probably correct there. Yeah. But anyway, 75. That's 75. great, right? Episode 75. Gotta love it. Rock on! Pretty cool. Go Pookie. Go <laughs> oh, boo! <laughs> <laughs> If you don't know, um, Sam and I call, have nicknames for each other, and they're really cheesy. Very. I am I am Pookie. She is, and Sam is Boo. This is true. Yes, and Sam's father one time when we made a family trip to Orlando, actually had shirts <laughs> made great. that said Team Kenny, and then they had our names embroidered, and he had embroidered on mine Pookie, <laughs> which <laughs> was funny. And it I was got great. I got a lot of comments from people like in the stores and stuff yes. there at Disney. Yes. Um, yeah, people be like, hey, Pookie. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty awesome. I, yeah. I loved it. It was pretty ridiculous. And, and you still awesome. have that shirt. I do. I love that shirt. Yeah. Yeah. So welcome to episode 75 of the show. Um, I have a couple of things I wanted to talk about right from the start. Okay. Here in Western New York, some of the Western New York vegans have started a fiber crafters meetup, which is right up Sam's alley. Hello. Yeah. Yes. And they're even trying to make it so that it's in between where we are and where Buffalo is so we don't have to travel all the way to Buffalo. That is so super cool. Yeah. So the first meetup is March 11th at 1.30, and that will be at the Angola Public Library. Vegan goods will be provided by the Planty Bigger. Which right there, reason enough to go. Yeah. Even if you're not a knitter, go for the baked goods. Yeah, there will be some Planty Baker um, scones, some really oh, delicious looking scones and stuff. Love their scones. And you can um, you can bring food if you want or bring a beverage. Yeah. No alcohol. No. It is at the library. It they, is. they don't want things getting out of control. Well, you know, the knitters, <laughs> they can just be crazy. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Absolutely crazy with the knitting. Yeah. So that's fun. And I'm looking forward to being able to make make it to one of those. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally looking forward to that. Yeah. Another cool thing I wanted to mention was if you're looking for a really entertaining vegan cooking show. And who isn't? Go on YouTube and look at Jane Esselstein, who is the wife of Dr. Esselstein. Yes. And her her and her mother have a YouTube where they cook, and they're just hilarious. Awesome. They are so fun to watch. Cool. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, so check them out, because they're a real hoot. All right. And you can just uh, look up Jane Esselstein on YouTube, and her channel will come up. Nice. Yeah. Do you Thanks. have anything, any Thanks news or... Uh, anything you've been up to in the last News week that you wanted to share? Anything we've been up to? Oh, well, we came to the conclusion after the uh, vegan pop-up market at the vegan center that we needed to give um, my whole little crafted store uh, an identity right, of its right. own. Yes, yeah, right. so that's very exciting. So Christine came up with the brilliant name uh, Cucumber Craftworks. Cucumber Craftworks. Yes, and so I am now working on not only getting our website store up and running with all kinds of new crafted products, but also uh, starting our very own Etsy store under the name Cucumber Craftworks. That'll be fun, and we'll keep you posted on how that's Yeah, I'm hoping going. to have that done early March. Awesome. Yeah. And hey, we got another vegan snack box from your brother. We sure did. Our second snack box from Vegan Cuts came our way. Uh, it actually showed up yesterday, which was Sunday. And uh, we got, uh, this is their healthy munchies and craveable crunchies mix. Um, I always appreciate a good rhyme. So. Yeah, lots of salties in this one. Yeah, lots of salties in this one. So this was a much more um, Christine-friendly box. I have a feeling that she'll be digging into most of these I will. snacks. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so just to let you know what we got, we got from Papadelics, 
We got their trippin' truffle parm mushroom chips. Yeah, I'm looking forward to trying those. Those are interesting. They're just like a dried shiitake with flavoring on them. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I'm leaving those for Christine. Yeah. Because even though I have become more fond of mushrooms (laughs) than I ever have been in my life. Well, you'll have to try them. I still don't think I'm ready for mushroom chips. Just try one. We'll see. Yeah. We'll, We'll figure it out. Then from AMG Snacks, we got some lemon energy bites. Lemon coconut energy bites from Nutso, and this we were both super excited about. We got a full-sized jar of organic tahini fusion nut and seed butter. Yeah, so it's like a tahini, but there's also other seed butters and nut butters yeah. in there. So Super cool. Yeah. We haven't tried it yet. But Not it yet, but it was, it's a full-sized jar. Awesome. Yeah. Then from Sweet Nothings, we got some apple cinnamon date-based snacks uh, with a center filled with creamy nut butter. Haven't tried those yet Haven't either. tried those. We got some organic dried plums from Sunny Fruit. They're prunes, people. They're prunes. Well, yes, dried plums are prunes. Yeah, but I just I think it's funny how they're, they're kind of like trying to dress it up. They're organic dried plums. Well, they're, right. They're prunes. Well, I, I think... And I love prunes. Okay, are but... Are there I, other prune lovers out there? There must be. Yeah. But I, I think maybe the idea of, of prunes, I think people think of prunes as being something kind of geriatric. <laughs> Wait, yeah, prunes get a bad rap. They do. Also, prune juice gets a bad rap. Yes. It's so really good. I understand why they're calling them dried plums. No, I totally understand it, but it did make me chuckle a little bit. Okay. Well, there you go. Then from Love Corn, we got some sea salt corn-based snacks. We got some New York dill pickle peanuts from Pizzoots. I tried the Pizzoots. And? They were weird. Weird. I like pickle-flavored things, but these were strange. Now, it was a small packet, Mm -hmm. maybe a handful of peanuts, Mm -hmm. right? A a large handful of peanuts. I ate them all. Okay. And all the while, thinking they were strange. (laughs) 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 Like, hmm. These are strange. I'll just keep eating them. Yeah. They had this kind of pickle aftertaste, but it it was very strange. They were strange. Yeah. 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 Um, And I'm glad that you tried those because as much as I love pickles and as much as I love peanuts, I can't imagine the two together. And you know, there's like a, there's a chip company that makes like a pickled, there's a couple of chip companies that make a pickled flavored potato chip. Yes, but that's a pickled fa- flavored potato chip. Those are Not good. a pickle flavored peanut. Yeah. Let's just say it's really hard to infuse flavor into a peanut. Because peanuts are so very flavorful on their own. Yeah, because now you've got pickle and peanut flavor. Yeah. So it was just a strange combination. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad you tried those because those were not for me. Now, (laughs) finally, we get to something that I am all about, and that is the white chip raspberry swirl granola from Bakery on Main. Yeah. Have you tried that yet? I have not. No, but when we were going through the box, Sam was like, that's mine. Yeah, that's mine. (laughs) (laughs) I immediately claimed it. That's mine. Yeah. Yes. Because most of this box uh, is so much more Christine yes, than it is salty. St- a lot of salty stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah. I claimed the white chip raspberry swirl granola and I'm very much looking forward to that. We also got some Mediterranean herb chickpea chips from Kibo, mm-hmm. which sounds delightful. And from Bakery on Main, also, we got an apple pie instant oatmeal. Yeah, it's like a little packet of, you remember the like Quaker oats oh, little packets? It's yes. like that. It only was it's all like, about the maple and brown sugar when I was a kid. Yeah, well, this one's is just like an all organic flavored instant oatmeal, yeah. which that's cool. Yeah. I'll have to try that out. Absolutely. And then as a bonus item, we got a little bag of lentil chips. Haven't tried those either. No, me either, but I love lentil chips. Lentil so. chips are good. I'm, I'm all I'm all into that. So thank you, Vegan Cuts. Yes, thank you, Vegan Cuts, and thank you, Owen. Yeah, thank you, Owen, for sending us our Vegan it's Cuts. the gift that keeps on giving. It sure does. And really appreciate, like, the full-size jar of that nut butter. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Looking forward to digging into that. Big time. I was going to say something about one of the things. Oh, the oatmeal, it made me think, I, I want to start overnight oats. People seem to like those overnight oats, and I have never made them. Well, okay then. 
And all you have to do is like the night before, thus the name overnight oats. Yes. You don't have to cook it or anything. You just take oats and, and nut milk and berries or mm -hmm. whatever you want to put in peanut butter, whatever you want to put in it, mix it all together, put it in a container or a jar and put it in your refrigerator. And then the next morning you have oatmeal, you have oatmeal, but now it's going to be a cold oatmeal. Right. So I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, I know I would not be into cold oatmeal. I'm barely into warm oatmeal. <laughs> a, a woman I used to work with used to bring a jar of overnight mm -hmm. oats, and it always looked really good. Oh, no, I've I've seen many displays in on various cooking shows yeah. and in various cookbooks of overnight oats, and they always look delightful. Yeah. But for me, like, I just, I've I've never been a big oatmeal person. Yeah, I'm going to, I like oatmeal. I'm going to try it because I'm usually more of like a savory, number one, I don't eat breakfast all the time. Usually no. I'm not hungry until the lunch, even the lunch hour. You right. Know? Yeah. Usually we only eat breakfast like on Sunday. On after a weekend. We get back from the shelter. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I might try it because it might be a good way for me to introduce more fruit into my life. You know, that's a really good point. Right. Yeah. So there you go. I support that. Hey, that brings us to our recipe of the week. We have a recipe this week. We do. Let's jump into it. Let's do it. Here is this week's vegan cookbook challenge recipe of the week. This week I made a recipe. I didn't even say we because Sam always gives me grief about that. I made a recipe this week because I was inspired by Dustin Harder's podcast where he interviewed the author of this book. It reminded me that I had this book, Plant-Based India by Dr. Ashil Shukla. Yes. This was one of the ones I got you for your birthday. Yes. And this is a fantastic book. It's gorgeous. It's one of those books that you just look through and go, ooh, oh, ooh. I want that. Yes. Yeah. And so it reminded me that, number one, that I had this book, and mm -hmm. number two, that I've been meaning to make a vegan palak paneer. Mm -hmm. And there is a recipe in this book, and he calls it palak tofu, which right. is appropriate because paneer is cheese. Yes. So I made this palak paneer, and out of this book, I also made his non recipe yes. for the bread on the side. And and it was lovely. It was lovely. And the thing about this recipe, number one, I've only ever had, I've never made palak paneer, mm -hmm. even before we were um, vegan. Mm -hmm. I've only ever had it either at a restaurant, mm -hmm. like an Indian restaurant, or those packets that you used to be able to get right, the, of, of Indian food. Yes. And they're, both the restaurant version and those packets are very rich and almost heavy. True. You know? Yes. And this is super bright and light, and it's a whole different animal. It really, really is. Yeah. Um, you know, even though Christine did include the the roasted cashews that yeah. were There's a variation encouraged. in the recipe, and he puts at the bottom of the recipe a variation for a creamier version, because I do like a creamier version mm -hmm. of Palak, it, which is, a, if you don't know, it's a spinach cream. Yes. And so he said for a creamier version, you can, you know, blend up cashews in your in your blender with some water and then blend it in at the end and, mm -hmm. and I did do that. Right. And even with that, it wasn't as rich oh, no, not as even what close. I usually expect from a Palak paneer. Yeah. No, it was a very, very light um sauce and that's not a bad thing. It no. was delightful. I really appreciated how fresh and light and like it tasted green. Oh yeah. You know, it yeah. tasted very green. It comes out this most beautiful, bright, oh, bright gorgeous. green. Oh, gorgeous. Yeah. Bright green. Yeah. So it was absolutely beautiful. I would have loved if it had a bit more heat to right. it. Right. And now it does call for green chili. Now, when a recipe calls for green chili, that could be a number of chilies. It could. Green chilies run the gamut. I got, I believe, an Anaheim. I got two Anaheim chilies. Mm -hmm. And when I cut the chili, I actually cut the chili, took out the seeds, and actually like chomped on a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. And it had heat. Mm -hmm. But I think in the cook within the cooking process, during the cooking process. Oh, sure. It loses little, some. It loses yeah. some. I could have put both of the peppers that mm -hmm. I bought. But, you know, I didn't want to overdo yeah. it. But now, you know, 
I'm constantly battling the heat thing. Well, you with know, the, and, with the green and chilies, and it's fine. It was completely fine. It was yeah. still a beautiful dish, and I would just, you know, if we make it again, and I imagine that we will, or if we make other recipes from this book, and I imagine that we will, yeah, um, you know, knowing that perhaps this book is geared towards a Western palate. Yeah, maybe. You know, and so perhaps it brings down the heat and the spice a mm-hmm. little bit, whereas we know that we thoroughly enjoy heat and spice. So I do. We can, In we Indian can, food, I like it spicy. So we can crank it back up. Yeah, if I could find the right chilies. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to find the right chilies. Well, we will go in search of the right chilies. Yeah. Now, I think if we traveled um, a little further and went to a Wegmans, they have a larger yes. chili selection yeah. than what we can get here. Mm-hmm. So That's that's very true. Yeah, that's something. The naan was a, a simple recipe, mm-hmm. and it was good. It was good. Yeah. It was very good. Yep, nice and fluffy and it was. soft and just exactly what a naan should be. You got to have naan with you Indian do. food. Even I if you're putting agree. it over Yeah, even if you're putting it over rice, I still want the bread on the side. Absolutely. I mean, it doesn't have to be naan. It can be roti, it can be paratha, it can yeah. be all kinds of things, but yeah. there has to be that I don't know, there's something about just digging in with your hands and yeah. that piece of bread that makes eating Indian food just so very satisfying. Yeah. So looking forward to digging further into this book, Mm -hmm. which again is Plant-Based India, uh, Nourishing Recipes Rooted in Tradition by Dr. Sheel Shukla. Check this book out. We'll have a link to it in the show notes because it, number one, it's a beautiful book. Yes. Hardbound, beautiful photos, Mm -hmm. and tons of really great vegan recipes. Yes. So check it out. Definitely. Do you want to talk about the noteworthy section? Yeah. Okay. So the noteworthy section, and in, you you hear the dismay in my voice, not because I I'm I'm talking about the noteworthy section. I'm fine with that. Really, I am. <laughs> um, but no, the dismay is over what the noteworthy section is this week. Mm-hmm. And um, that is, of course, the news that Miyoko Shinner has been removed as CEO of her own company, mm-hmm. Miyoko's Creamery, which started out as Miyoko's Kitchen. Um, now if we look at the article, um, and the article I'm looking at here is from Veg News, um, we discover that she will no longer be involved in the day-to-day operations of the, uh, vegan dairy company that she founded, but surprisingly found out that this change happened last June. Right. It happened in June and she was unable to speak of it. I don't know if it was because of, I'm sure it was because of some contractual thing that she was um, not allowed to talk about it Yeah. until now. Mm-hmm. And now the news has broken. She's being far more vocal about the situation and what happened. And apparently they did offer her a lesser role on the board and, and within the company and she turned it down. There's obviously some sort of thing going on within her company that she does not feel comfortable with. Some sort and something that's going against both her ethics and how she wants to run the company. Right. So without going too far into it, and I'm sure that this is a story that we will hear a lot more about in the coming weeks and months and um, that kind of a thing. I just want to put out there how very, very sad I think it is that Miyoko is now essentially separated from this incredible business that she founded, yeah. um, that she created, yeah. and that it's basically the corporatization of that company that is yeah. forcing this change. I mean, yeah, that's it's boiling down to the board and the investors didn't think that, that Miyoko's was carrying the company in the direction that they thought the right. company should go. They actually told her verbatim that she brought the company from zero to one and now they need to move on and find somebody else that can move the company beyond one. I would say she brought the company a lot further than Uh, one. Yeah, that's that's ridiculous and and to the point of insulting. Yeah, very insulting. Yes. And I'm glad she's being vocal about it. She's getting tons of support from the community. Which is not at all surprising. Yeah. Miyoko's has been a, a huge 
huge supporter of the vegan community. She has her she has her own animal sanctuary. Yep. She lives her ethics and and this is proof that she lives her ethics. Absolutely. That she was unwilling to take a lesser role and that she definitely would would rather walk away mm-hmm. from her own company than than be a part of what they're trying to do with it. Right. You know. And I, I have a feeling that, you know, the the company as it moves forward that Miyoko's now without Miyoko um will find out how very loyal vegans are to Miyoko herself. Yeah. I mean, once word really gets out because I am still seeing people that don't know the full story sure. that aren't sure that this wasn't a decision that she made on her own. Right. Um, once word really gets out that this is, this was something that she totally didn't want. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think once people realize the entire situation, they will definitely not be supporting her brand. Yeah. It's, it's, I think that is a very likely yeah. outcome. Um, mostly because, Miyoko's is a little bit different from some of the other vegan product companies we find, like Beyond and Impossible and right. even Gardein. Like, her brand is not really a crossover brand. Right. It's very vegan-centric. Yeah, and really not totally, not created to, um, I mean, the the weird thing is, is you don't create a business to not make money. But Miyoko's right. business really didn't start because she wanted to make money. Right. It was because she wanted to put good alternatives out there yes. with with real ingredients, with um, pure ingredients, with mm-hmm. clean ingredients, mm-hmm. and, you know, have there be a good alternative right. for people who don't want to eat dairy. And, um, and now I think that's kind of, that's what's kind of biting her in the butt, you know? Sadly. Yeah. Yes. And now word is coming out uh, just today that that her board and the investors are suing her for what they're saying is that she's trying to take intellectual property, which is, <laughs> hello, her recipes. Yes. Okay. Now, we all know how business works. There's probably contractually she can't walk away with a lot of those recipes. Mm-hmm. So I would hope that Miyoko's would say, fine, whatever, take them, ruin them, which they will. You know, they'll find cheaper alternatives to some of the ingredients and start over, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If she even has the will to do that at this point. Sure. Well, I mean, I imagine she's going to continue doing her outstanding work in the vegan community and in the animal liberation movement. And I've absolutely no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, What that will look like, of course, we have yet to see. Yeah. Um, but I do hope that Miyoko knows that um, we in the vegan community are profoundly supportive of her and um, that we are, are thinking of her and her best interests and, you know, all of that good stuff yeah. through this incredibly challenging time. Yeah. And, and just know that this isn't, this isn't un- an unusual thing no. that people are forced out of their own companies. This happens all the time. When a business grows to a certain level, that the person or persons who started the business a lot of times are ousted Yeah, in the end because the board and the investors, all they see are dollar signs. That's right. And if, if the person who started this business has, you know, a place in their heart and an ethical mission and all this, that doesn't always equate to dollar signs you know what i mean it doesn't and boards and investors don't like that you know they want it to all be about the bottom line and so yeah we of course like what sam said we wish miyoko the best and uh really look forward to what she does in the future absolutely we'll be keeping an eye on it yeah let's move on to our main topic Okay, let's do it. Our main topic this week is a real rager. Now, let's let's not go that far. <laughs> I can say for me, it was a real rager just researching this and and whatnot. This week's main topic is a study that came out of the University of Georgia in Athens 
and the research paper titled The Vegan Industrial Complex, The Political Ecology of Not Eating Animals by Amy, uh, Professor Amy Trager, a professor of geography at the University of Georgia in Athens. So what do you want to say about this paper? Well, first I want to say, I want to make it clear that Christine and I had differing viewpoints on whether or not this should be our main topic. Um, after reading the paper, I found it to be so incomplete, so cherry-picked, and so obviously written from the point of view who's someone who actively wants to uphold animal agriculture for whatever reason. I actually didn't want to give this paper a platform. Yeah, I mean, I can see where you're coming from, not giving the paper a platform, especially since apparently Professor Traeger is trying to get this made into a book, mm -hmm. this paper. I see. But I think it would be a, doing a disservice not to tell people or expose to people that there is research like this being done out there. Yeah. No, and I understand where you're coming from, too. Absolutely. But again, it's just I don't want to give credence to oh, the research. I don't think we are giving credence. I think what we're doing is saying, look, this research and other research papers are going to come up out there mainly because I can tell you from looking at the professor's CV, she has received hundreds of thousands of dollars in grant money, not only from uh, the University of Georgia itself, but from the USDA. The USDA, thank you very much. Um, and the National Science Foundation mm -hmm. and other organizations. And of course, we know that the USDA is absolutely in the business of keeping animal agriculture um, alive and well. Yeah. So when you see, I mean, if, if you follow the money, I mean, I know everybody says that, but really follow the money when you see things like this. Why, why is she creating a paper like this? Why is she looking for funding for papers like this? Because the money is out there. Yeah. So I just think it, it, we would do a disservice not to tell people that, look, this information is out there, but follow the money because it is basically a tool used by the meat and dairy industry to push this information to discredit vegans and the vegan lifestyle and the vegan movement. Yes, that's true. I mean, when I read this paper, almost one of the first things I thought of was, you know, that clip in Vegan 2022 where Dr. Greger is taking down this guy who is defending the paleo diet or the keto diet. Right. I can't remember which one it is. And he is saying, you know, well, hey, if you were just out there talking about um, lizard people, I could just dismiss you as a crank. But right. the information you're spewing is harmful and could actually kill people. Yeah. And I feel like that's very similar to what this paper is doing. Um that just immediately popped into my head. You know, this yeah. is this is Dr. Greger's flat earther. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can see why that would bring that to mind. She makes sweeping generalizations as far as the mindset of vegans. Yeah. Which, wow. Like, this is supposed to be a research paper, mm -hmm. not an opinion piece. Right. Don't say things like, vegans think more about the welfare of animals than the welfare of the humans that are involved in food production. Number one, hugely wrong. Yeah. Right? Number yeah. two, that's a sweeping generalization. How can you say that? Like vegans. What, did she talk to one vegan and they didn't care about, you know, human rights? Well, it, I mean, sure, but that's like any broad generalization, you know. What what do you think in sweeping generalization terms when I say the word Republicans? Right. Yeah, but I also didn't get hundreds of thousands of dollars to do a research paper. No, that's a very fair point. You, you know what not. I'm saying? This is supposed to be science. Right. Right? She's a professor of geography. Right. This but this is, is obviously not an unbiased look at the political ecology yeah. of eating animals. No, I'm going to include a link to the paper if you want to pour through it yourself. Mm -hmm. I can also include, if you think people would want it, 
my highlighted and annotated version of the paper. Where, I find that interesting. Where I kind of just, if you don't want to pour through it, because it is like 12 pages. Mm-hmm. If you just want to read the parts that I highlighted that kind of stuck out to me and some of the comments that I noted right. on them, I can include that in the show notes. I just did want to mention that she just numerous times has made this assumption that vegans don't care about the humans involved in our food production. She goes on about palm oil and basically basically states that vegans are ignorant of the palm oil industry. Yeah. Um, Well, first of all, not to make a sweeping generalization of my own, but most of the vegans that I have met are more aware of where their food comes from than the average person is. Okay, so yes, I fully agree with Dr. Trauger that, or Professor Trauger, that the palm oil industry is a problem, and it's a problem for many reasons. Number one, palm oil is an absolutely terrible ingredient to put into things. It's incredibly unhealthy, terrible for the cardiovascular system. In terms of its production, um, it's notorious for the use of child labor. There are incredible environmental externalities to be considered when we're talking about palm oil. But my issue with Professor Trauger's argument when it comes to palm oil is that she seems to be framing it only in the context of goods that are produced specifically for use by vegans. Mm -hmm. So mostly meat replacers, cheese replacers, dairy replacers. Now, the thing is, if you go into it, if you do any research at all, Okay, and I'm looking at Ethical Consumer, which is one of my favorite websites. Mm-hmm. And you check out what is palm oil used for? Well, friends, palm oil can be found in just about everything. It is not a vegan specific product. I would argue that the vast majority of palm oil that is used um, in industry is used in products that are not specifically marketed to vegans. Absolutely. We're talking biscuits and cookies, breads, breakfast bars, butter and margarine, cake, cereal, chocolate and chocolate spreads, crackers, chips, donuts, dried nuts, dried and canned soup, fast food of all varieties, frozen meals, frozen waffles and pancakes, gravy, ice cream, infant formula, instant noodles, microwave popcorn, non-dairy creamer, peanut butter, dog or cat food, pizza bases, salad dressings, stock cubes, vegetable shortening, vitamins, and whipping cream. And that's just the food items. If you want to go even further, palm oil is often a standard ingredient in many toiletries and cosmetic products. I know that Once I found out that the soap that I loved so much included palm oil, I switched soap brands because I didn't want that to be part of what I was consuming. So you'll find palm oil in biofuels, in candles, cleaning products, deodorant, detergent, lipstick, shampoo, conditioner, skin moisturizers, shaving creams, soap, sunscreens, and toothpastes. And that's just getting started. Yeah. So while I have no objection to Professor Troiger calling out the palm oil industry no, because it is not. a terrible industry. Correct. You need to call it out on all fronts. Right. You can't just say this is something that is harvested specifically to create products for vegans. Right. And it is because of the externalities worse yeah. than consuming animal products. Right, right. Um, Her argument is that vegans care more about protecting animals than protecting the humans involved, right? Right. But I would, like Sam said, I would argue that I feel that most vegans are probably more informed Mm -hmm. about products that contain palm oil than your average omnivore. Right, and are also more inclined to investigate where the things they purchase come from. Right. Because immediately we know that we don't want our money going to support animal agriculture. Okay? We fess up that we can't help it when it comes to our taxes, unfortunately. But that, Or the money that goes to grants from the USDA to people like this that can and, write papers. <laughs> and there you go. Yes, you know, thank you there's for our that tax dollars lovely at work. little connection. Um, but we can help it when it comes to our own 
purchasing choices. Mm -hmm. So yes, when we find something that we don't want to be part of, and that could be anything from animal agriculture to cocoa, chocolate is a terrible industry as well Mm -hmm. in terms of environmental destruction and child labor. Coffee is a terrible industry. Again, in terms of environmental impact and child labor. Yeah, she doesn't mention either one of those industries. Bananas are a terrible industry. And so I I wanted to check because one of uh, Professor Troiger's arguments was that the palm oil industry is notorious for child labor abuses, and it is, Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to refute that. But I I went through and I wanted to see um, what else I could find in terms of goods that are reputed to be produced by child labor in various countries. And so I found from the Bureau of International Labor Affairs a list of goods and their source countries countries, which it has reason to believe are produced by child labor or forced labor in violation of international standards as required under the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2005 and subsequent reauthorizations. This list, um, it's produced by uh, the list of goods produced by child labor or forced labor comprises 159 different goods from 78 countries and areas and is current as of September 28th, 2022. So on this list, not only uh, does palm oil come up because it most certainly does, but we're also looking at acai berries, alcoholic beverages, amber, artificial flowers, baked goods, bamboo, bananas, beans of all varieties, beef, blueberries, bovines, which is, of course, any bovine animal. And there's a long list of bovines. Brassware, Brazil nuts and chestnuts. Let me tell you, it made me sad to see those on the list because I love Brazil nuts. Yeah, nuts. Yeah. Um, And so we'll be checking that out further. But um, bricks. Bricks. Right. Yes. From many, many places in the world. We're not, I mean, we're talking about bricks from Afghanistan, Argentina, Bangladesh, Bolivia, Brazil, Burma, Cambodia, China, Ecuador, Egypt, India, Iran, North Korea, Nepal, Pakistan, Paraguay, uh, Peru, Russia, Uganda, Vietnam, and Colombia. Yeah, I mean... I understand she can't include every unethical product. No, of course not. In her paper. But at the same time, it's irresponsible to suggest that because certain products that may be consumed more readily by vegans than by non-vegans uses a single product that comes from or is often produced through child or forced labor is the reason for vegans being her term, unsensitive uh, or her term is a non humanism. Um, and she goes on to talk about how non humanism is at work in the vegan industrial complex to produce and perpetuate her theories. And she uses the soy industry as an example, never once mentioning. I mean, she does mention that some soy is grown for feed crops. Okay, but the thing is 90% of the soy grown on this planet is grown for feed crops. Right. And she, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but she does make a comment about organic soy, which is soy produced for human consumption. And even though she goes on and on and on about the soy industry, she says she doesn't have enough information about organic soy because the information isn't out there, which is, I'm sorry, I'm calling it, it's bullshit. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. But the soybeans that are produced, 90% of the soybeans that are produced on this planet, okay, are GMO soy and they're being fed to animals. Right. The other 10% is the organic soy that is made into tofu and other products for human consumption. So... If you're concerned about soy and its potential health effects, you have to think that the GMO soy is going to the animals, the mm-hmm. the 
pesticides, the herbicides, everything that is sprayed on these crops bioaccumulates in the muscles and the milk of mm-hmm. these animals. And so there you're getting a far more harmful product. So once that animal is slaughtered and is butchered and winds up under plastic in your grocery store, that is a far more dangerous product to consume than a block of organic tofu. Yeah. Here's the sentence that kind of, well, I mean, among other sentences that raised my hackles in this paper. But she says, while the benefits of soy as a health food are much debated, yeah, okay. Uh, Little is written in relationship to ethical diets with regards to its production, which is complete bullshit. There's all kinds of information out there about the ethical ramifications Mm -hmm. of growing soy. Sure. Okay. Yes. So what the heck? She has all these other citations for all this other information, but when it comes to soy and organic soy, all of a sudden she's it, it, she's run dry. There's nothing to you know nothing to cite. Well, I can't comment on to I can't comment as to why that might be, but um, you know the the question of soy's health benefits are debated. I, I won't deny that. They yeah. are debated. I'm yeah. not saying that they are debated correctly. Right. You know, but there is a misconception that soy increases certain hormone levels right. and that that can be damaging. Right. But she's she's a professor of, of science. Yes. Okay. The science is out there. It she is. should not have included, I'm sorry, but I think it's irresponsible to include the sentence that says that the health ramifications of soy have been debated. Of course they've been debated. Why don't you tell us what the science is behind all those arguments? Well, it doesn't serve her purpose in this paper. Of course it doesn't. Right. But I just think it's irresponsible. Well, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Absolutely. But again, you have to look at what purpose the paper is serving. Yeah, She says uh, ethical consumers reach for plant-based foods in the belief that they are protecting animals and the planet and do not consider how their actions impact other humans. Which is very, very untrue. Wow. Sweeping generalizations. Of course it's sweeping. Yes. Of course. Of course we do. Well, well, but the thing is, of course it's sweeping. It has to be. You know, it's. It's political. It's propaganda. Yeah. You know, those kinds of sweeping generalizations are what people get people, you know, off their butts and doing things, you know. I guess. I mean, I guess one good thing that could come out of the good professor's paper here is that it could anger people to the point where they're like, look, I'm going to email this professor and tell her why she's wrong. (laughs) You know, Well, and I don't know what that would accomplish. Probably nothing. No, probably nothing. Absolutely. You know, so I think it's fine for us to talk about it. This is why I didn't want to give the paper a platform. Well, you know, look, I don't think everybody's going to run out. And and if people read her paper, I don't think it, it I don't even know if she would know people were reading her paper. Well, probably not. You know not. what I'm saying? And I'm not saying it's something that would change any, you know, intelligent vegan's mind. Certainly no, not. No, but I think it's I think it's important to know how how vegans can be portrayed in in a scientific setting, sure. you know, um, she goes on to argue that a better way of life not is not to go vegan, is not to eradicate the animal agriculture industrial complex, mm-hmm. but that everybody should have a pig in their backyard and everyone should have their own home butchery. And that would be much better for the both the environment, for the animals, because now the animals are giving back. She actually says that the animals are giving back. And she states that there is no cause, that causes no harm having a pig in your backyard and raising it and butchering it for food. I would argue that the pig might have a problem with that. Well, yes, of course the pig is going to have a problem with that. No pig wants to be butchered for food. It definitely causes harm. And a number of times in her paper, she talks about how killing animals causes no harm. Well, yes. And the thing is, unfortunately, what she seems to be doing is to say that killing animals causes no harm to humans. And 
I would argue that it's hugely um, wrong. <laughs> well, yes, I would argue that vehemently because it causes a great deal of harm, particularly to those unfortunate people who are employed to do the work of slaughtering these animals. Mm-hmm. Um, it is highly traumatizing. Most uh, the turnover rate is insane. It's upwards of a hundred percent every year. Um, most people who work in slaughterhouses don't make it more than six months and then suffer PTSD and panic disorders because of the sheer magnitude of what they've been asked to do and the horrors that they've seen because of it. So that is absolutely harmful to humans. And then if we want to go into how animal agriculture harms humans in general, we just have to go back to, you know, bioaccumulation of antibiotics and the coming trend of antibiotic resistance yeah. and all of that. So she there... doesn't talk about any of that. No, no, now, no. No, I don't. It doesn't surprise me she doesn't talk about any of that because she is a professor of geology. Right. Okay. So that's not her purview. It's not her field. No. Yeah. But... She does go on to say the avoidance of accountability for harm through a facile association with ethics and a plant-based diet generates more harm to societies and the environment than it prevents. There's two general points that she wants to extend from the uh, empirics that she presents above in the paper. The first is that when plant-based foods are produced at a distance, the harm they generate is unseeable and unknowable. And is that totally the animal agriculture industry right there in a nutshell? Yes. The unseen harm yes. of the animal agriculture industry? It's Absolutely. Just, it kills me. She says the eater is shielded from the knowledge through deceptive labeling and campaigns and in so doing is no longer responsible or accountable for that harm. Um. Well, that is the animal agriculture industry in a nutshell. But she's talking about plant-based foods. Yes. Causing all this harm. Yes. It's rage. Flames on the side (laughs) of my face. (laughs) Ooh, she brought out the Clue reference. Are any Clue fans out there? Oh, I hope there are Clue fans Definitely flames on the side of my face reading through this article. Heaving heaving breaths. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Love it. She, so she goes on to talk about animals being harvested for the purpose, the purpose of giving humans life. Come on. It, we don't need to eat animals to sustain life no, as humans. No, we do not. And we, we absolutely know this, yeah. you know. So I understand your consternation, you know, at reading this paper and your desire to make sure people know that it's utter nonsense but at the same time why give it a platform (laughs) well i guess i'll just repeat myself and say but it could because i think it's important that people that animal advocates that vegans that animal lovers um supporters of the movement know that there is this platform out here out there for people that is being subsidized by your very own tax tax dollars. Of course. That somebody is going to work every day at a university and she's teaching students and God knows she's probably, you know, teaching her students all of this and she's receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars in grant money from the USDA and multiple other sources to put papers like this out there and then to turn it into a book. She is now trying to turn this into a book. I basically think that she's just part of a giant propaganda machine. You know? Yes. You just hit the nail on the head. And I'm not trying to give her a platform. I'm really not. I just I just think that people need to be aware that this is the kind of thing that we're up against. Certainly. That's fair. When we're talking about going to Washington and lobbying. Mm-hmm. Like, Connie just mo- she's moving to Washington. Go, Connie. She just moved. And when, when we're going, this is what we're up against. Yes. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in grant money going to just this one person. Mm-hmm. So you know that hundreds of thousands of dollars are going to several, probably thousands. It's entirely of, possible. Of scientists. And I'll use air quotes because this isn't science, this paper. 
No, this paper is not. She may be a, sci- a professor of science, but this is not science. I agree. This is bunk. Yes. Pure bunk. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's just important to let people know it's out there. Okay. And that... That's fair. And that we should um, de- debate it and debunk it and... Um, sure. Send her an email. You know, I mean, of course, be kind. Always be kind. And of course, be respectful. This is this woman's livelihood, you know, whether you agree with her opinions or not. But why not send her an email and say, listen, I had an opportunity to read your paper on the vegan industrial complex. And I would just like to bring up a couple of thoughts Mm -hmm. of mine. That I thought maybe you might include in your next paper <laughs> instead of making sweeping generalizations well, about vegans. Well, but the thing is, this, again, I don't think that that would do any good. I don't think that this is a person who is interested in presenting a balanced viewpoint. Yeah. This is a person who is, through her research, you know, that research, which is being subsidized by the USDA and other organizations. Mm-hmm. Her goal is to fabricate science that will prop up the animal agriculture industry. Yeah. And that's because these large organizations, these huge government organizations, see the trend of veganism as a major threat to the status quo. Yeah. Yeah, there's a um, a really good video that Jake Conroy just put out, The Cranky Vegan. Yep. Recently, where he because he goes out to all of the um, agricultural websites Mm -hmm. and he recently found an article on one of those websites that stated some of the things that they're worried about as far as um, protesting and things that might disrupt their 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 production and their business. And um, funny enough, a lot of it is not anything people are doing right now. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is stuff like what Connie and the AFA are doing. Mm -hmm. That's what worries them most. Well, of course. Is that kind of, is like hitting hitting them in systematically. Right. Is what worries them most. Of course. Yeah. Systemic change is terrifying. Yeah. So. Especially when you're the one in control of the system. Right. Yeah. You know, protests and rallies and bearing witness to animals being slaughtered, thats I think that's all to the good. Mm -hmm. But I don't think those are the things that actually scare the producers of meat. No. The idea of Connie Spence being in Washington advocating very vocally for vegans and for animal liberation and for systemic change Mm -hmm. to our food production systems. Yeah. That would be scary. Yeah. So that's where, I mean, if you want to make change, that's where we should be driving the car to, you know, point the car in that direction. Yeah. So we can make real systemic change. So are are you telling me that you're moving to DC with Connie? (laughs) No, but do we will do anything that we can to, uh, raise her message up Certainly. to support support the entire AFA and and what they're doing, and to inform people of how it's going. Of course, you know, yes, because because the consumer side of it is not working. It's not enough. It, it's great that we're all going vegan. I want everybody to go vegan. Sure, it's great that we go to the grocery store and we don't buy animal products. That's fantastic. But still. Every day, every year, more and more animals are slaughtered. Yes. For the food system. Yes. It's not it's not making a change. No, it's not enough. So yeah, like I said, I'll 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 leave a link to the paper if if you want to pour through it. Um I'll leave my link because I don't think anybody should pour through it because believe me, I spent uh a a better part of an afternoon pouring through this paper. And I'll just share with you what I highlighted, and you can look at that if you want to. I'll leave it in the show notes. If you feel like raging out for an afternoon, like I did. <laughs> 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 Let's move on to something else. Hey, what's your uh, reason of the week from your 72 reasons to be vegan? Okay, this week we have reason number 55, uh, which is crowding out food is easier than cutting out food. Um, So the idea 
here is that with a nutritious plant-based diet, you add enough nutrient-rich, fiber-filled plant foods to your diet that before you know it, you don't have any space to squeeze in the old earth-damaging, health-threatening foods like meat and dairy. Hmm. Okay. So, you know, a lot of times when people think about dietary change, they think about cutting things out. Mm -hmm. Um, And... That makes sense. That's how diet in general has been framed right. in Western culture. But um, if you instead think of, okay, I'm going vegan, therefore I am adding beans, grains, nuts, seeds, you know, every kind of vegetable under the sun and fruit and all of these wonderful things, then you no longer have room for the stuff that is harmful. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. Yeah, I really like that, actually. Rather than looking at it as restriction. Right. I mean, we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, yes, some will see veganism as being a restrictive diet, but you and I agree that our diet has gotten far more interesting since we stopped eating meat and dairy. Definitely. Yeah. Like, we have a lot more fun. With we food do you know, than we used to. You're um, not really forced, but you're you inc- you are including more beans that you mm-hmm. may not have eaten. Yeah, different veg that you might not That's have right. been eating in the past. Different grains that you yes. might not have eaten in the past. I mean, come on, you made pasta today, which was outstanding, by the way. Thank you. And um, there were beans in the pasta. Mm-hmm. White beans. White beans mm-hmm. with a, a spinach pesto and all kinds of lovely vegetables, and it was great. Yeah. You know, we're going to talk about that next week. Yeah, we are. So I won't give too much away now. Sorry. <laughs> Tune in next week to find out more. Right, to find about... out more about Christine's recipe. <laughs> yes. But yes. So that's my reason. Number 55, crowding out food is easier than cutting out food. And I like again, it. that's coming from 72 Reasons to be Vegan, Why Plant-Based, Why Now by Jean Stone and Kathy Freston. Yeah, we can leave a link to the book. I keep forgetting to do that, but we'll leave a link to the 72 Reasons in the show notes. So Sounds you good. Pick yourself up a copy. Maybe every day, just open it up. Like, what are those other books where you open it up and it's like a... a a phrase or something to help you get through your day. Oh, like books of inspiration yeah, like or a, like in, the chicken soup yeah, books, something which like should that. not be chicken soup. They should be veg, veggie soup. But, yeah. Veggie yeah. soup for the chicken soul. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'll leave a link in the show notes to that. Sounds good. Yeah. Hey, let's move on to something really fun. Our listener shout out. Just want to give a shout out to all my fans watching. I love you guys. I love you. And so today's listener shout out is to Michelle Petkowitz. Michelle is a new listener and very recently she made her way through our entire back catalog. That is just crazy. That's crazy, Michelle. That is crazy and amazing. I I love it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, She is a music lover, animal lover, rescue mom, and a vocal vegan. So Michelle, we want to thank you for listening. If you send us your info along with your t-shirt size, we will send you a Compassion and Cucumbers goodie package pronto. Yeah, so you can either email us that that information at uh, compassionandcucumbers at gmail.com or you can Facebook message us or uh, Instagram DM us your information again your t-shirt size and your address and we'll send you a goodie bag yep thanks michelle thank you michelle let's move on to housekeeping let's keep the house and we're still holding our food not bombs fundraiser at our buy me a coffee site that's it buymeacoffee.com backslash cucumbers and we're raising money for the buffalo chapter of food not bombs and they provide vegan meals for people in the Buffalo area that have food insecurities. Absolutely. We want to hear from you. So email us or DM us show ideas, cookbook recommendations, recipes you love, or subjects you'd like us to touch on. We're just getting started with this whole podcast thing, and we would love to hear more of what you would like to hear. We would. Subscribe to our YouTube Uh, Every week, I upload the entire show to our YouTube channel. And in the future, I'm going to be including maybe some vlog type stuff on there. I'd love to do some recipe videos. Totally. I've been totally researching, you know, filming recipe videos and all that. So, uh, yeah. So, subscribe to our YouTube. Absolutely. Comment on the show on YouTube. Give us a shout out. Totally. You know, like, 
smash that like button and all that jazz. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can join our Patreon. The link is in the show notes. Uh, there are three different levels of support. Each come with their own special bonuses. So if you would like to help us improve the show, uh, just go right on ahead and join our Patreon. Yep. And leave us a review on your podcast app if it allows. Uh, five stars if you feel like it. I'm not, I'm not going to push anybody into it. But if it's only taken you 75 episodes not to push people into it. <laughs> if you'd like to leave us a review on your podcast app, if your app allows, that would be great. I would love that. She sure would. Um, also, if you can share the show with a friend or family member that you think would enjoy what we do, that would be awesome. It is one of the best things you can do for any content creator, and it costs you nothing at all. Yeah, and share our social media posts. If you see us on social media, comment and like and share. Yes. And finally, um, as always, please join the AFA Vegan Voter Hub and give to their good work if you can. Uh, they will be advocating for us and all of our animal friends um, during the new legislative session and up to the uh, vote on the new farm bill. Yeah, that new farm bill comes uh, into play in, in, September. in September. So time is running out. Definitely join the Vegan Voter Hub. And if you can support the AFA in any way monetarily, uh, we highly recommend that you do. Absolutely. And that's it. That's we've, it. Re we've reached the end of episode 75. We sure have. And thank you so much for listening, everybody. It's This has been a tough one. I know Sam really didn't want to talk about that ladies paper. <laughs> well... <laughs> And see, here you go. Now you're going to make it difficult for us to wrap up. <laughs> you had to start into a new conversation. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to engage with that. Okay, wrap it up. Wrap yes, it up. Wrap it up. Yeah. Thanks again for listening. And we hope that you all have a fantastic week. And that we, we do. We'll talk at you again next Tuesday. Not at you. To but, you. With you. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. The end. Do you want to support the Compassion and Cucumbers podcast? Well, you can do that by joining our Patreon page. We have three different levels of support, and all three come with their own special bonuses. Hey, you can support the podcast and get yourself some really cool merch. All the links and deets are in the show notes. We'll catch you next week on the next episode of Compassion and Cucumbers.